thing. Thank you. I have got a hard drive somewhere, so it's just a case of spending a bit of time cleaning up my computer. All right, we're recording. Cool. So we're all here today um, because I'm going to mute anyone that is not muted. Just oh, I can't anymore. I don't have the power. I gave it to Inga. <laughs> Can you please mute yourself? You're not speaking just to avoid background noise. Perfect. So the reason we're here is because Terrell and Claudia, do you want to give yourself give a wave, Terrell and Claudia, for those who don't know you, who are at Camp Versailles in France, have been dreaming and scheming about creating uh, camp events for children. And uh, it's nice to see a child in Karen's <laughs> playing with something that they probably shouldn't be. Uh, yeah, events for kids at camps. And I thought it would be nice if some of the camp coordinators who have done so could share their learnings. Um, and I know that I didn't formally ask you, Claudia, but I'm, I'm guessing that you've ha you have children coming to your events as well. Um, so maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, and it's really on Claudia. <laughs> So maybe yeah. if if there's time, if Rose doesn't come and you'd be happy to, it would be great to hear some of your learnings from kids events that you've done as well. Um, but we'll kick off with with Sylvia, who did an event with children at Camp Altiplano in the summer. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass the baton to you, Sylvia, to share okay. how it went, what you did. Hello. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm at Campo de Plano. So we are in, um, yeah, you maybe know about it already. We're in the south of Spain. <clears throat> and last summer in July, we decided to organize a summer camp for kids. It all started because a family of Alfonso, who's the owner of the land, has some kids that were here um during the quarantine basically and they really enjoyed being on the farm and doing things on the farm and they had some friends over so basically through them um we decided that it would be nice to just have more kids coming and organize something actually arrange and have activities so <clears throat> we were uh, quite some people it was uh me and Bailey from the side of uh, Camp Altiplano then it was Yannick and Jaco from the side of the Regeneration Academy, which is another project on the farm. And then uh, two people from the family of Alfonso that were mainly taking care of the sleeping and accommodation of the kids and the food and all those. Yes, sorry. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit slower. <laughs> um, so mainly those two people were focused on the side of the accommodation. The kids were sleeping in tents. We have bell tents and there were three or four kids with tents. Um, and the food was being cooked by an external person that we paid for the, it was a 10 days uh, activity. Um, so the food was being prepared by, by an external person that we were paying for the time of course the camp um, and let me see I have some pictures I want to share with you if I can yes I can share them. so I'm just gonna talk a bit about um, the organization I guess and uh, um, the activities that we organized so um, these are the tents, as you can see. My computer is a bit slow. Give it a second. Oh, this is the Spanish one. Well, you could probably still see it. These are the tents where the kids were sleeping. And we were starting every day around nine uh, with kind of a check-in with the kids. It was kids from 
9 to 14 years old. We had 20 kids, mainly from Madrid, so from the city. Uh, and that was also very interesting to see what happens to kids from the city when they're in the countryside. Um, and um, yeah, so we were starting the day around nine with basically a check-in in which we're asking the kids to say three words about that would describe thoughts that they had in mind on how, how they felt. And then we would uh, just explain the activities of the day. And as we were many people, we had, it would have been really intense to be constantly involved in the whole program. So there were always two people in each activity. And then the rest could either help as side support, I don't know, bring in snacks at the time of having snacks or uh, making sure that all the materials for the next workshop were ready and things like that. Plus, we had two extra hands from two volunteers, 18 years old, um, that helped us a lot with basically taking care that all the more practical things were ready whenever they needed to be ready, and, uh, and uh, entertaining the kids in the moments in which we were busy preparing something else and uh, we couldn't be there. So these are the tents. Uh, they were sleeping outside. Um, we were having uh, a snack in the middle of the morning, then lunch, and then a break after lunch. We would either watch a movie or they would play outside, always with a person with them. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we had more activities. And sometimes we organized also evening games that were a lot of fun. So different activities we did. Uh, for example, uh, we started with uh, and on each day, this is the morning check-in, on each day would have a specific theme. Uh, so we had the day of biodiversity, the day of uh, water, the day of soil. So kind of also try and give them a bit of a, yeah, kind of a line that we were following throughout the day and looking at trying to focusing also on what they learned during the day related to that topic. So it was a mix of sometimes a bit more educational activities and um, more theoretical, let's say, and more just games and fun things. We were trying to keep a balance, maybe 50-50. This was on the last day where we organized a theater. Uh, so the idea was that they would divide it in groups and it would represent uh, something that happened throughout the week. And uh, bring in some learnings, but also some funny things, try to introduce a crazy element in the story so that it was also going to be fun for them. So we had, for example, a beekeeping workshop uh, where a local expert that works with the regenerative honey came to the farm and uh, he showed us the, the I'm sorry, how do you say the beehives and um, this was a very incredibly successful experience. The kids that were indeed at the beginning, very distracted coming from being in school, wanting to just be outside and do their own thing. If you wanted to have them sitting somewhere, listening to you, it was very difficult. Um, and this was a moment which actually have, had to be calm it's around bees, uh, you have to were protection, to be quiet and everything, and it really worked nicely, and they were all really amazed and trying the honey directly from the beehive, and it was really nice to see them getting really close to, to something that they were super scared about at the beginning. The most difficult target group, according to me, is the 13-year-old girls, <laughs> because they're very much into TikToks and very just they don't get surprised about anything. So that was the hardest to get them involved in what we were doing. For example, one day we went to work in the vegetable garden. So we were doing some harvest. We did a game in which they had to recognize the vegetables that we had there. And they knew very little about how vegetables look like. And, and they could try some of them and, and they were, one girl specifically was just trying some lettuce and being like, this really tastes really strong. And I was like, 
yeah, isn't it nice? It really has a nice taste. And she was like, no, actually, I don't like it. It tastes too much. I like the one from the supermarket. So you're really confronted with a different reality. But we could really see that throughout the 10 days, they were becoming much more comfortable in this new environment and just also finding their own ways to fill up uh, gaps in time in which nothing is really happening, maybe after lunch or finding games to do. So this was the beekeeping activity. And then, as I said, this was the theater, the morning check-ins. Then we did a, gate, a day dedicated to water and we talked about rainwater harvesting. So we first did a quiz in which they had to guess how much water we use in our household uh, for, I don't know, showers or flushing the toilet or doing the dishes and being a quiz they were also really involved in it. And then the idea was that we built these little houses and they had to build the best uh, rainwater harvesting system. So again, it was also always kind of putting a bit of challenge in it and seeing which teams, which team can collect the most water, which team answers the most questions in the right way. And I feel like that really also gets them engaged. This is a uh, godly on the farm and we went there to look at uh, erosion basically. Um, so we wanted to show them how erosion looks like. And here you can see in the picture, you don't really see, but you can see different types of soils of amazingly different colors. So we just had them walk around and look for stones. Also just being outside and, and looking at the environment and seeing what attracts them. And um, yeah, and then they had to dig some erosion control dams and little things to prevent erosion. And again, then we threw some water on it to see which was working the best. And this was also quite fun. Here we were doing the measurement of how much water is flowing through the dam and how much water is actually staying in there. This is again the theater of the last day. And uh, yeah, let me think if I have anything else. Yeah, then for example, we, because we have the ponds, then one day we went swimming in the ponds and the idea was that they could uh, look for animals there and see what they could find. They found a snake, they found frogs, and at first they were all a bit disgusted to jump in the pond, it's very muddy and everything, and then everybody was playing with algae and mud and just being okay being there. And then we went there again at night after having a fire outside and they were making jokes and uh, telling jokes. And then we went back to the ponds at night with, to with uh, hand torches um, to look again at nightlife in the ponds. And that was also really nice. Uh, yeah, then the day in the garden and then we cooked. We did, a re we organized a restaurant for all the people on the farm. So we made fresh pasta with the grains from the farm. We made pizza, we made salads and things with vegetables uh, harvested from the garden. And uh, also there, it's a lot about being organized in small groups. So we actually were many people involved in everybody doing one different thing with the kids. And, and then we served dinner to everybody on the farm. And they were really proud about what they made. And yeah, this one then, yeah, riding horses, playing with the arch and bow and arrow. Uh, we did a kind of a treasure hunt. They had to go throughout the farm and they had different uh, things that had to solve, like make a TikTok. So we tried to make it a bit more uh, in line with what they usually do, make a TikTok in the garden with the vegetables or go and and shoot with the bow and arrow to to the sign in front of you or answer some questions about the learnings of the week that was the, the activity of the last day so they were just running around in groups throughout the whole farm and trying to solve their their tasks and yeah in the end we had the winners and blah 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 so this is basically it um, I don't know if there's a specific questions more related about logistics or other things. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask where the kids came from. Uh, did they pay? What kind of level did they pay? What, you, what the age group was and so on? Yeah, so it was um, mainly kids from 
Madrid. Um, that's, as I said, it's because we kind of had a connection already from uh, kids of the family of the landowner. So it was friends of them and then friends of friends. So that was basically the way it was promoted. Uh, from nine to 14 years old. Um, and they paid 450 euros, uh, right? It was 450 euros for the 10 days. Mm -hmm. And that also included insurance. So we, we got an insurance for accidents and everything. Um, what was the other question? Oh, I think you've covered it fairly well, thank you. Where they yeah. came from, who they were, what they paid. That's the yeah. That's good yeah. Got a I, there's another one yeah. here in the chat from Seb. How did the children get to camp? Um, if you mean physically, they took a train, most of them, uh, and then we picked them up at the train station. Some other kids came uh, with their parents that drove them here. Uh, what did you learn from your first camp and what do you plan on improving? Improving many things, but also <laughs> learning that you just have to be very flexible in a way. It helped a lot that, as I said, we were many people. So that whenever I was busy with the activity we had organized and we were two people running the activity, there was always somebody else that was kind of doing their own thing, but ready to jump in in the moment of need or, of, I don't know we don't have any water, drinking water, and we are in the fields, or uh, we need more snacks because the kids are really hungry, or things like that. So, so that's really, yeah. sorry? Just to quantify that a bit more, how, so how many children were there in total? 20. And 20. we were one, two, three, four, four people organizing and running activities and then two extra people that were mainly focusing on the accommodation of food. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, any specific insurance? As I said, we got an insurance um, and yeah, you basically, I guess that's how it works all over the world. You say for how many people you need the insurance, what age they are, for how many days, if it's day and night or on the day and um, so depending on that the prices change. Um, could, yeah. could I ask whether it was primarily um, a kind of educational um, uh, awareness raising event or was there any element of fundraising for use of money at the camp? Basically, the money we received was split it up amongst, uh, as I said, the Regeneration Academy, which was the other two people that were working with us, and then the camp. And the money that went to camp went back into paying my salary and paying activities at camp. And uh, the same for the Regeneration Academy. So it basically was covering costs and then having a bit of extra to, yeah, to pay for, Thank you. for activities. Would you do it again? That's the question we asked each other every day at the end of the day when we were absolutely destroyed. <laughs> that, but we said once a year, yes. Because it was very intense. The kids can drive you crazy sometimes. You have 20 kids in the same room screaming, everybody talking about different things, everybody wanting to do something different. But it was also a lot of fun. and. Yeah, for me personally, it was really nice to see what I was saying to basically how they got acquainted with the countryside and how they kind of changed their attitude towards things around them okay. and just got a bit wilder. It was nice to see. Um, so we said, yeah, once a year we can do it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of yeah, being focused that nothing happens. That they're all good and everything. But yeah. Mm. Sylvia, how do you think it would work with like half of the number, like eight to 10 kids? I mean, I, we're thinking about in Camp Pierre Soleil here, I don't think we can handle 20 kids, at least not for another couple of years, but we were thinking of maybe doing smaller program, you know, week to 10 days, but more like for eight to 10 kids with very similar, in fact, the things we were thinking of are right in line with what you guys did and the activities and the 
mixing of education with fun and um, but I was just curious what you might think of having a smaller group. Yeah, I think it could definitely work. It's easier for you indeed. We were actually thinking at the beginning to have just 15 kids, mm -hmm. but we got more requests. And then one by one, it was like, okay, 16 is okay. 17 is okay, okay. And then in the end, it was 20. And it worked out okay. We were a bit worried at the beginning to be able to manage so many kids, also specifically in activities like the cooking, in which we had tons of different things to do. And when you have a big group, how space-wise it's also difficult. So I think 10 kids would be good. In terms of covering the costs, then maybe you have a bit more trouble when you have less kids, basically. But I think activities-wise, it's it can be really nice. And it was one week or, or 10 days, did you say? Yeah, 10 days. 10 days. There's a question from Seb about how you marketed the camp to the parents. What did what was it called? Yeah, indeed, that was something we talked about a lot. And in the end, we just called it summer camp. <laughs> and the in the description, we basically put that it was a mix of educational and um, being in nature and basically, yeah, mainly kind of like for kids for being in nature and learning about it. So not only playing games, but also this more educational side and being on a farm also. That was a plus, so you're actually outside in nature in a place that you're not used to. Yeah. I can, I don't know if you're interested, I can share with you, for example, the flyer we had. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any other resource and I, we did it in English, yeah. so that was a thing that, um, so it was all Spanish kids. Um, but yeah, we decided to do it in English and that also that was the extra learning for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some kids were complaining about it a lot, also because all of us that were actually giving activities speak Spanish. <laughs> Sometimes it was a bit awkward to try and speak English and we're like, just say it in Spanish. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, so we organized it, so there was this extra layer of learning. Mm -hmm. Another question? Oh yeah, kids summer camp connecting with nature could be a title. Yeah, I'm, I, I think it definitely can be. Of course, it depends. I think it depends on who are the the, the parents, parents directing yourself to. Yeah. If you have, as we had, like some entry points, so we kind of knew which kind of people we were uh, mm -hmm. talking with. Um, so if you know that they're interesting in this connection with nature, perfect. If they're more into the horseback riding and archery, then maybe. Yeah find some other way of marketing it. Mm -hmm. Engaging them, right. Yeah. Can I ask a couple of questions, Sylvia? Sure, Just, yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, two, one about the logistics of, I, I think you mentioned it, but I, I didn't quite get, get it, um, where they were staying and what they needed in terms of like yeah, facilities to stay in and bathrooms and showers, all that sort of stuff as well. And, and then the other was just, yeah, I suppose, the age group that you chose, like nine to 12. Just wondering, would you have considered doing it with younger kids or what other issues would come up then around slightly younger kids? I suppose, yes. That's two things. Yeah, so the accommodation, um, they were staying in tents, but they were next to a house. So actually all of the use of the kitchen, toilets, showers, everything, it was in the house. Um, so basically the tents were just for sleeping and, um, and then for the age, it was 9 to 14 and we actually thought it was a bit too much of an age gap, um, especially the nine-year-old kids, they were mainly like the sister or the brother of an older kid in the group, but yeah, they were a bit on a different level both on what they wanted to do what they liked or what they knew about things and their way of engaging so yeah i would say maybe 10 
11, 10, 10 to 14. It was really, I feel like the nine years old were the, the biggest gap that you could see. And maybe sometimes finding activities that can work with such a you know, broad range, you have either the 14 year old getting bored or the nine year old not understanding what's going on. So yeah, maybe 10 to 14. And maybe also sometimes you can just split them up and just have different activities for different age groups. And uh, yeah. Would you be able to share the the flyer that you used and also the do you have a, a schedule written down for the activities that you did? Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's gonna be complicated. Now my computer is really slow and I see that if I try to open the drive, everything's gonna collapse. But I can <laughs> you can just send it to me or Inga and then we can pass it on. Yeah. And I think the schedule, it's a really nice tool that we use because we try to make it extremely detailed. Mm -hmm. uh, also with the names of who is responsible exactly for each activity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that was a nice. Mm -hmm. Then of course, as I said, things change and you adapt, but having and knowing that there's these people that's gonna be doing this from this time to this time, that helps a lot. So yeah, I will send it to you Ashley and then you can share it with the rest. Cool. Is there, are there any other questions? Uh, who here is thinking about organizing kids events at their camps? <coughs> I mean, I'm guessing that's why you're all here. <laughs> um, are there any specific questions that you have that you'd like to ask? other people in the group or just have a more of an open discussion about what you're thinking and planning and you know the vague ideas that you have formed already about how it could work for you i think it would be interesting to hear um, in, the, um, in the gambia the um, level of income is, is quite low and so we would be probably aiming and we do intend to run such camps we would probably be aiming for in the international school and uh, uh, where parents can probably afford it, but we would mix that in with kids from a local area. Um, and um, the mixing of uh, kids from different backgrounds, we have found in the summer camps we've had, we've run already to be very interesting. We've run a climate, a climate change camp. Uh, we've run a kind of entrepreneur type uh, uh, camp for young, uh, slightly older adolescents. And um, we're very fortunate in having a number of um, lodges uh, close to the sea uh, so that we can use the accommodation that's already there without having to hire the, the vehement of the accommodation charge. And uh, I think um, having sufficient people is one of the really important things. Uh, it's a real struggle. I, I, <laughs> I actually sympathize um, with Campo Altiplano because I know just how much hard work it is, so uh, well done. Can I just pipe in here? Um, um, sorry, just on the subject of uh, bringing people from the local community into these things, because sometimes, yeah, if you're in Gambia or like me in South Africa, there's quite a large disparity between people's income, and I think for us especially, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Sandele Eco Retreat, it's it's important to have the lower income groups of children attend these events as well. And the way we've kind of done it in the past is by having sponsorship from municipalities, local municipalities, um, and just directly contacting them, saying, we've got this event going on, we think it's beneficial to so many people in your community would you like to sponsor a child to come to our event? Um, and through that, they'll be able to have this incredible educational experience and help restore the land. And uh, that's one way we've been doing it. And also sending out a similar kind of concept note to these from, as we would to the municipalities to also 